So welcome back to those here in the church and those watching online for the fourth and final Bampton lecture by the brilliant Professor Willie Jennings. And the final lecture is titled, Addressing the Hateful Conditions of the Line. May I also remind everyone that there will be an opportunity to discuss these ideas from these lectures with Professor Jennings this afternoon in an informal seminar at Harris Manchester College, 2.30 to 4 p.m in the Warrington Room, but you can just ask at the Porter's Lodge uh, about where to go. Harris Manchester College, just on Mansfield Road, very close by, please come to the seminar. So, Professor Jennings, welcome back to the podium for the fourth and final lecture, thank you. May I again thank Dr. Shaw for this opportunity to be with you. It has been a fabulous time, and I, if I might, also lift up her wonderful assistant, Kate Wilson, who has been absolutely wonderful. So if you see her, please thank her for me, for her kindness to me and my family. My family has been with me. Um, they took the prerogative of not listening to all my lectures, which I'm very happy about. They've heard me many times, so but I am thankful for their presence as well. Addressing the hateful condition of the line. Howard Washington Thurman believed that hatred must be overcome. He believed that the workings of hatred must be thwarted. Such belief should not be taken lightly because it demands the complete configuration of a life around it. It is the kind of belief that cannot be compartmentalized in an intellectual life or an ethical practice or a moral vision because it requires the whole self to be located, housed in a discipline that materializes love. Howard Thurman is famous for his espousal of the love ethic of Jesus. His articulation of that love ethic stands alongside what has been said about Jesus' love ethic by all the towering intellectuals of the 20th century. Thurman, however, in a way unmatched by most of his contemporaries, saw the depth of hatred that must be addressed to enter the way of Jesus. Hatred, as far as Thurman was concerned, as far as Thurman could see, had not been analyzed sufficiently because too many people, too many intellectuals were afraid, he said, even superstitious of the reality of hatred. Too many, too, 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 too many were superstitious to, and so to stare too long at it might reveal it in the one looking. Thurman sought to describe the anatomy of hatred in hopes of delinking it from human life and societies. I want in this final lecture to follow Thurman's analysis of hatred, not just its anatomy, but its architecture. Not only its workings in the inner states, the subjectivities of individuals and groups, but its formations and forming capacities in the built environment. To be clear, Thurman saw this connection as well, and so I am, in a sense, lifting off from his side glances and his theological glimpses of a problem on the ground born of a misperception of the ground through the creation of a habitation, through the creation of habitation inside of enclosures and lines. For the working of hatred to be thwarted, the overcoming must be built from the ground up. These lectures have sought to touch dwelling as the goal of the creature with God. The idea of dwelling as I've used it in these lectures means 
becoming a habitation through God, becoming a place where building, designing, and living, disciplined by the Holy Spirit, align, and where the earth here understood as specific places of dirt and water, plant and animal speak through us. Dwelling means that we earth creatures are called to participate in the triune life of God and through that participation to enter a shared project of living, shared project of living. That shared project weaves together, yielding to the spirit and listening to our creaturely kin in the work of creating the built environment in ways that materialize the redemption of God. The built environment must be rethought as a site of salvation. This has been the heart of the matter in these lectures. And now with this final lecture, we confront, confront that which has woven itself into our concrete living like polluted water and air, hatred. Thurman in Jesus and the Disinherited entered the place of hatred. Like someone working at a toxic waste site, he examines the contours of this poisoning reality. His outline of hatred is elegantly clear. It begins with contact without fellowship, by which he means it is, as he says, I quote, devoid of any of the primary overtures of warmth and fellow feeling and genuineness. What follows this is an understanding of people as that, an understanding of people that is strikingly unsympathetic. In our current language, we would say that this is a clinical and unempathetic understanding of people. Next comes ill will articulated through a philosophy of relation that justifies hostility. And finally, there is the embodiment of that ill will in someone who, as Thurman says, and I quote, becomes hatred walking on the earth. The anatomy of hatred that Thurman describes, I contend, is more centrally a matter of architecture. Through his analysis, Thurman has brought us to the place of hate's incubation and the legacy of colonialist-shaped design. That is, the dreaming of the master made concrete in the shaping of habitation. I have noted in earlier work that there is a deep problem at the heart of Western education. There at the heart of Western education is an overarching image that drives its formation goal. And that goal is to form all of us, regardless of our identity, <clears throat> our people, our gender, our sexuality, our hopes, our dreams, our dispositions, our gifts and talents, to form all of us into white, self-sufficient men who embody three dismal virtues, control, mastery, and possession. That goal formed between the dreaming of the father, master, slash plantation owner, and the aspirations of his children to fulfill his dream and show through their education the finished man, even if they were not a man, ready to lead, ready to control and manage the colonial holdings, ready to handle power and thereby to present to the world the way the father and the grandfather wanted to be seen in the world, to have their lives eternally recognized and honored through the work of their children and their grandchildren. What has been the case for the formational goal of Western education must also be seen as guiding so much of building, architecture, 
and design in modernity and colonial modernity, where the dreaming of the master class, the owners, materializes in their designing and the design aspirations of their children, ready to show that they can build, literally build a future. That tyranny of design has been placed upon all of us. Now, let me say, I am not suggesting that all designers, architects, engineers, and developers operate nefariously. Nor am I saying that there is no good in the built environments we inhabit, no architecture that uplifts and inspires and does good work in the world, nor am I saying that modern colonialism brings us for the first time to environments created to control the masses. What is at stake here is a reckoning with the history of control, masquerading as freedom that materializes hatred through architectural design and through its execution in the forming of the built environment. I don't just mean, I don't just mean the design and creation of prisons or even concentration camps, but also the structuring of neighborhoods and cities, as well as the structuring of the social practice of design to enable the continued pouring of the master's dreaming into the ground itself. What is also at stake is the thwarting of another's dreaming that might be poured out into the ground. A vignette that's probably a poem. Scott was a lovely young white man now, in tearful lament, he and I and his wife Linda sat in the corner of the room talking after the group of young professionals at his church had concluded our meeting at the pastor's home. His lament formed as part of his confession to me of what he had not done. He was a serious Christian and an architect, working for one of the most powerful firms in the city. At that moment, at that moment, they were designing buildings and entire city blocks and neighborhoods that would shape the lives of tens of thousands of people. In large buildings, large offices, a very small number of architects and engineers were planning for the masses. <clears throat> it was, according to Scott, a very white space. But his sorrow began in what they shared as they designed, amid soaring ideas about that would capture the beauty and the power of sunlight, the importance of airflows, the ingenious use of open spaces and open views onto the streets. There he also heard strategies for keeping out black and brown bodies unless they had significant money. Plans for controlling who goes in and who goes out. Designs for coalescing the financially comfortable into more comfort and quietly building a social hierarchy that would shout out who is in charge at every moment. And Scott said nothing. But this was not, this was not only about what he would not say, but also what he was allowed to design and allowed to build. Thurman observed in The Anatomy of Hatred what I, would what I would term the architectural deception of contact. 
the architectural deception of contact. We should consider it a gesture inside the condition of delusion where a sense of ownership establishes the hierarchical character of relationality between people. Deceptive contact is as ancient as people shaped in uneven power relations. The strong and the weak speaking gently and respectfully to one another, recognizing the threat and danger if that interaction exposes the truth of their power differential and turns adversarial. Architectural deception is found in the fact that just because people live structurally in proximity to one another <clears throat> and cross paths regularly, <coughs> excuse me, live close enough to see and observe and understand one another, that they are in Thurman's words in warm fellowship, in my words, aimed toward dwelling. That architectural deception was on full display with the practice of Southern gentility and hospitality that Thurman knew so well between white and black folks were practices of kindness and consideration covered over white supremacy, concealed relentless asymmetrical exercises of power, influence, and control, and grotesquely uneven distribution of resources. It is this architectural deception of contact growing out of the long history of modern colonial relations throughout the world that sustains what I have called geographic whiteness. That is, <clears throat> spaces formed in the desire to create communities that quietly, emphasis on quietly, quietly normalize white dominance. These are spaces that normalize the absurdity of grotesque disparity in quality of life separated by only a few miles, a few yards, or even a few inches. Precisely where the forming of those spaces is presented as for the common good. Thurman calls these spaces zones of agreement, where a sick kind of civility and even intimacy superintends the fixed status of the powerful and the displaced, and contacts between them are, as he says, and I quote, merely truces between enemies, a kind of armistice for purposes of economic security. End of quote. <clears throat> it is here with Thurman, with Thurman's zones of agreement, that we should note one of the most egregious works of colonial shaped design, and that is the formation of life within the line. The line is the property line. But it is also so much more, my friends. As we've already anticipated with the previous lectures, we can now say clearly, we all have learned to think the line and to live the line. And in fact, we have internalized the line. There is a quote from Reviel Nez from his wonderful book on the history of Bob Wire that I always like to repeat. He said, a closed line was made to prevent motion from outside the line to its inside. And from that closed line, we derive the idea of property. With the same line, we prevented the motion from inside the line to the outside and we derive the idea of the prison. And then with an open line, we prevent the motion in either direction, and from it, we derive the idea of border, property, prison, border. It is through the prevention of motion that space enters history. This is the conclusion of the colonial mapping of space across place. The lordship 
the lordship of the line. Lines are everywhere. We know them in so many ways. They guide design. There is, in fact, for us, no designs without lines. They guide the fabricated distinctions between nation states who all share a common earth. We all know or should know that nationalism was a new way to reassemble life with land inside the line. Modern nationalism, however we wish to define it, is at heart ownership, property ownership made plural <clears throat> and made the universal right, the universal right of a people to their space. Yes, as we said earlier, there is attachment to the land, yes, there is blood bound to soil, and yes, there is deep sentiment and sensibility born of living in a land, but this is different from sheer possession by, different from being claimed by. This is owning the land. Nationalism places people inside borders and borders inside people in alien presence. Yet few of us, few of us will confess out aloud the artificiality of borders because of the profound operation of the line. Lines create the compelling illusion that separation exists where it does not. I am not saying that ideas of peoplehood bound to place is new, nor am I saying that ancient peoples did not claim place or go to war over land. Obviously they did. The crucial matter here is design. At one level, it is the spatial and architectural design, the spatial and architectural design of enemies. Enemies formed both within and outside the line, foreign and domestic enemies. Thurman places these enemies in three groups. The personal enemy, that is the enemy in the intimate space of one's family or people or community. Then there is the enemy who by their betrayal of their own people brings shame and humiliation on their own. They share the secrets of the people with those who would do them harm or they carry out the policies of the powerful to the detriment of their own people. What binds what by, then, excuse me, and then there is the political enemy, the occupier or those seeking to take and destroy a people. What binds all these enemies together for Thurman are the lines that we draw around them and the lines they draw around themselves. The design of enemies points to another level of design and that is the spatial and architectural design of our lives, the realization of someone else's dreaming down to the bone and the dirt. What does it mean to live inside someone else's design? What does it mean to live inside someone else's design and for someone else's design to live inside us? The interior here is one reality, one psychic, social, material, and geographic fabric woven through a history of racial formation. As I have written elsewhere, race has always been a matter of geography. Racial identity emerged as the other side of the coin of modern private property. Those modern colonial settlers not only transformed the land, they also transformed the body. Fundamentally, fundamentally, they transformed both into an enclosure. The new world, this geographic world as we know it, would not have come into existence 
unless people were forced, forced through violent means to end seeing themselves through the land and water and plants and landscapes and seasons and wind and rain. We would not have the configuration of space and body that we inhabit had untold numbers of people not been told that they carry their identities without remainder on their bodies and that their histories, memories, sense of being and knowing, cultural practices and rituals for living are carried in them like fleshly Swiss army knives and each attribute can be pulled out of them at will. They were taught, we were taught, they were taught that nature is the same one reality and cultures are what we bring to nature, like paint on a blank canvas. A horrible idea. The colonialist schema established through death, disease, greed, deception, and the strange theological vision that made the earth a thing God gave to humans, presented everything and every single body in our world as enclosed. This is the design inside the design. The body inside the building. The building inside the body. The creation of enemies and the construction of enclosure are woven together. One more time. The creation of enemies and the construction of enclosure are woven together. There is a depth of isolation rooted in an abiding racial and geographic insulation that is inherent to the body in the built environment. It is an isolation, is an insulation that enables isolation, dances with isolation, and is fundamental, it is fundamental to the incubation of hatred, especially among the poor, the oppressed, and the disinherited. When Thurman turns his attention, when Thurman turns his attention to the hatred carried by the poor, the disinherited, the oppressed, he enters a space of knowing the depth of which can easily escape the contemporary reader. This human being who knew the words of his grandmother and felt through them her experience as a slave. This human being who also saw the pain and suffering of his own parents and his people who knew the concentrated brutality of racial America in its undiluted years. This man received the grace to see hatreds working in those who deserved better than hatred working in them. His analysis did not accuse, did not accuse the disinherited of agency corrupted by hatred, but hatred offering a form of agency, a form of agency constituted in and refreshed by the built environments designed to conjure hatred's power. Thurman's ability to see the working of hatred while not intellectually working with hate illumined a space of creativity right at the site of that design. Space of creativity right at the site of that design. Thurman saw the possibilities of a different designing inside the designs that formed hatred. A different dreaming inside the designing that formed hatred. How does one build inside of built environments formed to establish geographic whiteness? formed to secure the materialization of the designs of a few, designs rooted in the spirit of ownership and angled toward control and surveillance, designs that incubate hate. The question for us is one of living 
in the aftermath of an alienation created by race and private property, executed by the line, an alienation that weaves together insulation and isolation. I am interested in another option for the built environment in the aftermath of enclosure, where alienation permeates both our bodies and our building. The other option I seek draws life from the site of Jesus' life. Again, the crucial question. What does it mean to live inside someone else's design and for someone else's design to live inside us? At the site of Jesus' life, we meet God drawing us and showing us the life of one who yields and listens. And in this way, in the yielding and the listening, prepares for us a life together of dreaming and building. A poem, touch a sign, touch a sign. In the moments of my doubting, when old sorrows inherited and therefore unearned steal into my thinking space, constricting my mind breathing. The old black folks taught me to touch a sign. They said, open your windows, hear the wind, signifying through the trees. See the ground stand at attention at the sun's gaze the light dancing with the leaves, sense in the small silences between the robin's cry and the bluebird's shouting, the slow forming of an amen. And remember how we can dream as we awake and why we love even if pain greets the day. On those days when my doubting refuses to yield, emboldened by injustice and willful ignorance, nurtured by the rain of insults, each one stinging like biting flies and smooth sucking mosquitoes, at the appointed hour of their choosing, when the sun shows its wisdom. Tan, dark, tan mothers of the temple everywhere lead me outside while inside and inside while outside. Place my body next to that old tree, its branches stretched out as if suspended in air, creating a canopy from which to hang melancholies alongside sparkling joys. I drop my head and realize I am standing on its roots, big, thick things, one with the black dirt constituting the ground, the floor of it all. The tree says to me, nothing becomes, nothing thrives without this grace. The prophetic life in Israel is always a listening life. That life has always been a mixture of God's revelation and human imagination at the site of struggle, S-I-T-E, at the site of struggle of, and suffering and exile. The prophetic is rooted in human listening to God speaking, bound up, bound up in God listening to human speaking and dreaming. As the great Rabbi Abraham Heschel taught us so long ago, God builds a future for Israel inside of their dreaming 
and inside God's dreaming made known through the prophets. Both dreams, both dreams are God's work. And all of this is carried out in the dirt, woven in water alongside plant and animal, sky and season. In Jesus, that speaking, that listening, that dreaming open to us through a fleshly invitation to life with him that will unfold. This is the place where we must center the building, the body, and design, each working through the other in the unfolding of the divine life, in the life of the creature, in the life of the creature, in the divine life creature life in the divine life. It is in the unfolding where we anticipate what will appear through the building and the dreaming. Like artists, like artists, unsure, unsure of what the art will manifest. Yet we are guided by the yielding to the spirit and to the listening to creaturely kin. We anticipate, those are the words, we anticipate the unfolding, and anticipation is crucial here. This is the deepest tragedy we face with the built environment. Because it is formed in alienation and angled toward hatred, it robs us, it robs us of an anticipation in which we experience the freedom of God. Such an anticipation grows out of the yielding and the listening that should be the compass, that should be the compass for our creativity. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. But we do know, but what we do know is this. When it is revealed, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. It is the not yet appearing, the not yet appearing that should energize the building, the body, and the design. The goal is not to capture what will be. The goal is not to capture what will be. The goal is the centering of our imagination inside the possibilities of the new. New ways of building, new ways of embodying and designing together that will dwell in the freedom of God. And to allow those possibilities, those possibilities to structure life down to the bone and to the dirt. This is the continuation of the words of Mary embodied in Jesus, where the social, economic, and geographic order are being overturned by her son. That overturning is inside a building up in the freedom of God. It is a freedom that draws us always to the power and the work of love where we envision new possibilities of relation that might help us confront the failures of habitation all around us. Those failures are summarized nicely by the historian and sociologist Richard Sinnett when he states, and I quote, there are two ways, there are two ways to shun alien others. Flee them or isolate them. Each way can take a built form. These are in fact the options that can constitute the built environment and govern the work of building, body, and design today. Flee them or isolate them. 
And these options are modulations of our alienation. Option one is to flee the stranger, flee our enemies, and the stranger who potentially might become an enemy. This option makes fleeing the inner logic of the built environment. And here we are touching on the reality of marinage made concrete, that is, of escape and of structures of living built for and in escape, built for and in escape. Maronage, both as term and as a historical reality, is rooted in the flight of African slaves from the bondage of slavery into wilderness areas to establish living against the governance of slaveholding societies. That modern flight from bondage echoes ancient Israel's flight from captivity. It is fleeing for the sake of living that opens to a particular kind of creative work to build a reality of freedom woven into life with the living God. Yet the modern building of freedom is woven into the quest for sovereignty and self-determination. And therefore, it is a vision of freedom that dances with the possessive logics of ownership. Because escape, escape, is always a quest for control. This dance has been at the heart of the struggle for so many peoples to create life-sustaining habitation amid the takeover of their lands, the poisoning of the ground, and the ongoing greed-drenched legacies and energies of white supremacy. The current struggle for us now is to capture a reality of freedom without being entrapped by the possessive logics of ownership and turn toward life-draining forms of productivity and creativity. Building in escape and for escape has also been the inner logic of whiteness, of places formed in flight from non-white peoples. <coughs> Excuse me. Communities distanced by money, by location, by policing, by real estate practices, become the sites for cultivating people in the disposition of the plantation master. These are those who embody a strange configuration of freedom, one that just states a desire to control one's environment and enact one's will in the world, even if that willing is imagined for the common good. Escape as a logic of the built environment, escape as a logic of the built environment in the hands of the displaced or the powerful yields a similar broken thriving, a form of habitation with its back turned against life. Sorry, I lost my place. Just one. <laughs> option two brings us to the work of, of, of isolation, where the built environment comes to function as an engine of enclosure to ensure protection against the stranger, the enemy, or the potential enemy. The built environment as flight is also a work of enclosure. But here we enter a level of adjacency that does not need to structure escape. Rather, it works to establish the trinity of security, comfort, and normalcy in order to construct and sustain hegemony and normativity. You must discipline the dirt, form it into concrete that might bend perception to your will. That bending of perception for us now means that we are pressed to see ourselves 
as closed circles existing side by side, touching only because we share the earth itself. We return with this option to the formation of the ghetto and the closing down of living options for the displaced. But we also enter the work of rehabilitation of sequestered spaces, where, as I mentioned earlier, George Lipsick notes, poor people, and especially poor black folks, have been able to turn segregation into congregation. That is, they have been able to build structures of care amid terrorizing spaces. As we noted with the last lecture, in such spaces, people have cultivated stunning works of self-possession through the arts and the art of living with lack. Unfortunately, isolated spaces begat isolated spaces where two kinds of self-sufficiency coexist, one that sustains life and another that drains life. The first kind is shaped in wealth where resource-laden areas make connection beyond a well-traveled circuit completely optional and intensely purposeful. Here, people have what they want and need at their fingertips, in walking distance, and at ease of travel or request. These wealthy closed circles are often layered like a nesting doll. Each circle reveals more concentrated resources formed in tighter circuits with increasingly limited access by outsiders. Together, they complete the colonial dream of control of space and a refined productivity. These isolated spaces realize a freedom that articulates a quiet sovereignty. Areas, areas that speak power and control. The second kind of self-sufficiency forms out of a lack where resources, resource-deprived areas make do with what is at hand and in so doing often feed upon itself. Isolation as a logic of the built environment cultivated by the powerful and forced upon the displaced constitute a suspended middle between a hateful intentional segregation and creativity deployed to structure forms of thriving even in isolation. Yet isolated thriving, isolated thriving is in fact diminished living. It is shut off from the destiny of the creature to share with each other in the divine life. To oppose these options of the built environment, my friends, is to oppose that which now appears not only logical, but permanent, bolstered by a reconfigured, reconfigured excuse me, web of life that entangles us in endless exploitation by making ownership the only option for living and the only escape from it is dying. We have been brought into the lordship of the line where we come to both know and create our enemies and where territoriality and bodily integrity have been so tightly woven together that a life without sovereignty and self-possession makes no sense. These are fabrications bound to captivity. They present a creativity turned against us where the building, the body, and design lack the communion with God they were destined for. The overturning is necessary for our freedom, and yet it is a freedom only activated by love. Thurman understood that love especially love of enemy, requires this overturning inside a building up. And I quote, love of enemy, Thurman says, love of enemy means that a fundamental attack must first be made on the enemy status. 
How can this be done? Does it mean merely ignoring the fact that he belongs to the enemy class? Hardly. For lack of a better term, an unscrambling, an unscrambling process is required. Thurman's unscrambling process happens where those in power and those outside of power, those privileged and those without privilege, work together on creating a common environment structured in an abiding intentionality, intentionality of life together where there is the enacting of care by design. Care by design. With this insight, Thurman is calling for the ground. He is invoking the dreaming and the building. And here is where he is aligned with the life of Jesus once again and the unfolding in anticipation of what will be. As Thurman said in his interpretation of how Jesus dealt with the woman caught in adultery, he says, Jesus treated her as if she were already where she now willed to be. He believed her into her fulfillment of her possibilities. He stirred her confidence into activity. He placed a crown over her head, which for the rest of her life, she would try, she would keep trying to grow tall enough to wear. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. These are the words spoken by many generations of Thurman's text, especially one Martin Luther King Jr. And for all of us, this is the anticipation that must find its way into the ground, down to the bone and the dirt. Such an anticipation is the prerequisite for the materialization of God's love in the built environment. Thurman glimpsed love as a structuring reality, and we must bring that structuring reality to the built environment where new dreaming poured out into the ground opens life. And here is where I wish to end these lectures, with the dreaming and the dawning of a new work of dreaming. It is the dreaming that must permeate the building, the body, and the design. This is dreaming that strategizes new possibilities, new possibilities for intervening and interrupting the work of real estate, of architectural design, city planning, development, and engineering with a set of questions that must become inescapable. Questions that materialize the demand for love in the building. Now, let me be clear as I close. I am no romantic. I understand that what I am suggesting is a matter of serious contention. What I am suggesting is a matter of struggle, of fight, of life and death. Anytime you speak of what people should do with land and on land, with habitation and with building and design, you are in for a serious fight because you are touching the engine of it all. But this we must do. This we must do because we have been touched by the creator of it all who has in fact redeemed the creation through Mary's baby. Jesus, through the power of the Spirit, would materialize that redemption precisely where we have been afraid, afraid, to imagine redemption. The words then that Jesus spoke, the words that Howard Thurman accepted down to the bone and the dirt are the words I will close with. Be not afraid. 
Thank you very much. We will save our questions and discussion for the seminar this afternoon at 2.30 at Harris Manchester College. So all remains for me is to thank Professor Jennings on your behalf for this enormously creative and imaginative set of lectures. Thank you for bringing your wisdom to us, Professor Jennings, and also the wisdom of Howard Thurman uh, in your development of his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, in your Bampton Lectures, Jesus and the Displaced, which I hope will be the title of the book based on the Bamptons. <laughs> it's been enormously enriching, important, and delightful for us to have you with us here in Oxford. We've had the great pleasure of your company for a week. It's been fantastic. We've also loved hosting your wonderful family. Um, and so thank you for everything that you've brought to us. Incredible theology, but also the delight of you. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>